Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Architect Slack, Keith Adams. Thank you very much. I'm Keith. I uh, really appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to talk to you here today. Um, just a quick show of hands if I could. How many people know what Slack is? Okay. Wow. It's changed. Um, how many people use Slack at work? Yes. All right. So a fair few. So we can kind of hurry through some of the, the nuts and bolts here. So Slack's a persistent group messaging application. Um, and we aim to make your working life simpler, more pleasant, more productive. Um, and you might wonder what a persistent group messaging app has to do with a really successful vendor that makes boxes that has something to do with virtual machines. Um, well, it has a few things to do with Nutanix.next. Um, first of all, Nutanix is a, is a customer of Slack. Um, and so uh, we're happy to have them as a customer. They're a large customer of Slack. Thank you. Um, but we also share a bunch of values. Uh, right? So we're, we're also technologists. We have something sort of deeper in common than just the class of application we happen to be working on. Um, and the set of values we talk about is, is what uh, this segment's about today, which is, uh, goes under a bunch of different names, but has to do with sort of creation of software for business that is pleasing to use. And I'm going to try and convince you that you should take this seriously. Uh, if you're a technologist who makes software for other humans to use, this is actually part of doing a good job these days. Uh, and also, as a user of software, and we all are, even if you do make technology all day long, you probably spend more time using software than you do creating it. Um, this is also a set of things that you're reasonable to expect, a set of things that, that you should feel okay asking for. Um, Slack is trying to kill email. And we're not the first software startup to try to do this. Uh, I'd like to think that we're the first one to maybe have a chance of making a dent at it so far. Uh, we do have 3 million daily active users on a typical weekday these days. Uh, and if you believe a McKinsey report from a few years ago, Knowledge workers spend about half their days doing things that Slack has a really good chance of making more productive. Uh, they spend about 28% of their day, and this is observational, by the way, this wasn't, uh, this wasn't a survey. They spend about 28% of their day managing email. Right? So messing around with email, sending them, receiving them, reading them, curating them, messing with filters, and so on and so forth. And 20% of their time looking for either uh, internal experts or internal documents that explain uh, something that's already not, you know, that's already sort of been established inside the knowledge base of the company, inside the company's collective intelligence, um, that they're running around burning shoe leather trying to figure out. Um, these are all things that Slack tries to directly address. Right? And Slack is opinionated, right? If you start using Slack at your company, there's a chance it's going to become a different kind of place to work. Uh, and that's intentional. Um, Slack tries to make communication low friction. It tries to default to visible communication where possible. Um, it makes things searchable. There's a record. So the people who didn't happen to be in the room when the conversation was had can find out what the decision was later on, can discover what, you, what happened the last time this problem came up later on. Um, and it also uh, makes your organization more transparent as a collective set of these things. Right? An emergent property of all these things is that it's easier to figure out who's doing what. It's easier to figure out how people are spending time and what the real priorities are. Um, you don't have to take our word for us necessarily. If we go and ask our users how much more productive it makes them, they, the weighted average of their responses is that they're 32% more productive. Um, this same survey response tells us that they're spending 25% less time in meetings, which is another uh, kind of deadweight loss in all of our work lives that we hope we can do something about. Um, and another kind of uh, just connection that came up once we started talking with, with some of the executives here at Nutanix is just that uh, Nutanix itself is a hard place to imagine without Slack, it sounds like, from the outside. And maybe I'm biased. But um, you know, one of the, the anecdotes that strikes me really strongly is that there's a channel in the internal team uh, just for Nutanix champions, basically just for kind of power users who are advocates of the technology. Uh, and the level of access that they have there for a user group is really unusual. Right? You know, there are C-level executives kind of popping in and paying attention to this, uh, which is pretty much unprecedented for email, right? If you just sort of fire off an email to the, the CTO or CEO of you know, some other tech vendor of yours, uh, you know, your odds of getting a timely and uh, relevant response are a little low. Uh, and you know, the general theme and secular trend that we're outlining here in this, uh, in this chunk of the conference has been called for several years now the consumerization of IT. And you know, something about this term has always kind of subtly bothered me. Um, 
And I was actually talking with our founder CEO about the, this talk before I came and gave it. So Stuart Butterfield was talking to me about this. And he has a similar kind of thing where this just kind of somehow, something on his neck stands a little on end when people start talking about the consumerization of IT. Um, and you know, when, when many computers made the transition from you know, physical teletypes to glass TTYs, right? That wasn't interpreted as like uh, the televisionification of mini computing, right? That wasn't the way that people talked about it. Although it so happened that sort of mass adoption of CRT has made that more feasible, right? It's just things used to be really terrible, right? The only way to interact with this computer was with this little printout gizmo that clattered and, you know, made a bunch of noise and that you need to feed with paper. And now they're much, much better because you have a glass TTY. Uh, and that's the kind of change that's taken place here and is going to continue to take place. This idea of like consumerization of IT makes it sound like, you know, some sort of pendulum is swinging and maybe it'll swing back and we can, maybe we should go ITFI consumer now or something. Um, and I think that this, the, the, that, that sort of hyperplane that separates these two things is just an arbitrary artifact of where our business happened to be when, when some of these changes took place. Um, I think I'm kind of trying to make happen, and we'll see if this catches on, is the humanization of IT. Um, at some level, the reason these things are different is because it's human beings using the software, and they don't stop being human beings just because they happen to be in, a, in an office. Right? So the same way that human beings have finite cognitive capacity, and they don't want to spend all of their cognitive capacity learning about your software stack and its weird abstractions and its funny vocabulary. Um, and they're, uh, they're also social, and they're funny. Uh, sometimes they're scared of looking stupid. Sometimes they're curious. Um, and uh, you know, this blend of uh, the, the mix of these moods and things that happen are going to affect the, the way that business happens at your company. And the social design of software ends up having a bunch of impact on this. Um, Quick personal anecdote here, uh, and I promise this will be brief. I started my career at VMware uh, in the year 2000. I was there for about nine years. Um, and VMware is, in, in my mind, you know, almost a prototypical enterprise software company. Um, I learned a ton at VMware. I have a bunch of colleagues that I'm you know, proud to call ex-colleagues who are still there. Uh, great company. Um, and it very much belonged in my mind, you know, the, the sort of user interface paradigms and the way that we were building things at the time for humans to use seems like a kind of typical example of, you know, some of the issues with, with enterprise human interaction. But on the enterprise software side of things, we were making really reliable stuff. Uh, and I, I remain very proud of sort of the level of reliability we were providing at the time. Um, it was software that was competing with hardware, right? The comparable thing was a, a box. So it needed to have kind of performance and reliability that could at least sort of stand some sort of direct comparison with a box. Um, and then uh, I went to Facebook for about seven years. So I've been there from 2009 until uh, about six months ago. And Facebook is probably a prototypical consumer company. And at first, this, uh, a bunch of friends of mine found this kind of puzzling. Uh, but honestly, what drew me to Facebook was just that the product was like utterly great in some way that I didn't really understand at the time. Um, and hopefully, I understand a little bit better now. And a thing that fascinates me, uh, and this, of course, at the time when I was joining Facebook, I didn't really have a business. It was sort of trying certain things. Uh, it turns out the business at Facebook is advertising, um, which is a very different business than enterprise software. And now I find myself at Slack, and Slack is in some ways a, an interesting uh, Frankenstein's monster that blends uh, parts of both of these experiences in that uh, it is essentially an enterprise software business in the sense that we make money by making software that people like enough that they write as checks, and then we cash them, and then we can go hire more engineers, and they can write more software, and so on. Um, it is a much less complicated business model to articulate. But the way that we're doing that software uh, methodologically and in terms of the languages we're using, the tools we're using and stuff, borrows a lot from uh, companies like Facebook. We're using dynamic languages. We're pushing new software many, many times a day. Um, and in part, that's because that's what the market has come to demand. And so this next little bit here, we're going to start talking about how human beings have been changed uh, by the last few years of software. And we'll get some humans up there in the title. Um, and this is, you know, you can look at this from two different ways, right? When I'm sitting there doing my job at Slack trying to make stuff, I look at this as a set of constraints uh, that, are, that are forced upon me by users' expectations. But the rest of the time when I'm sitting there being a user, I think of this as a bill of rights. Like, these are things that I can basically start to take for granted over the next few years. And one of the big changes is that I expect my service provider to operate the darned software for me, right? There was a time, especially in enterprise, where the software artifact came along with, you know, maybe a shelf full of books, 
And if the software did what the shelf full of books said it was supposed to do, then the software was good software. And the user had no basis on which to complain because it matched the books. And if it didn't, then maybe it was a bug and so forth. Um, nobody, I, I never got a shelf full of PDFs from Google. Right? Google has never asked me to read a weird book about how to use Google.com. It has always tried to just kind of figure it the heck out when I try to do things with it. Um, and that's a surprisingly reasonable and possible thing in many scenarios. Uh, there are a finite number of, of actual plausible workflows in lots of scenarios. Um, this doesn't, you know, and, and if you've had the experience, by the way, of working at a consumer internet company that operates at any kind of scale, operating software is hard work. Like, operating software takes a lot of expertise. It takes people with a ton of talent. Uh, a lot of times it takes people, you know, waking up at odd hours. Which uh, brings me to my next uh, chunk of the Bill of Rights here. I'd never, I've never asked myself what version of Google I'm running. I've never asked myself what version of Facebook I'm running. Um, I might, you know, there are clients that have versions and so on, but I don't get to choose uh, whether I get, you, you know, version 72.3.14-7 of Google.com today. I just get whatever's on the menu. And if you try to immediately take a kind of trained model where there's a big complicated pipeline of software production and at the end of the pipeline a big chunk of new software is born and you, you know, press it on CDs and drive the CDs out to, out to retail channels and things like that. If you try to take that directly to, okay, well now we're going to just start forcing this down people's throats whenever we feel like it, that doesn't work, it turns out. Um, there's an art to, to doing this in a way that's incremental and in a way where you can have high confidence that the small changes are actually adding value faster than they detract them. And this is a kind of an interesting claim about user expectation because this isn't about software quality. This is about the first derivative of software quality with respect to time. Users now expect not only that your software sort of does stuff, but that it's going to do more stuff tomorrow. And if they come back in six months and it's really still just doing the same old stuff, they kind of start to wonder what you've been up to. This one's a little bit tough for, uh, for enterprise audiences to digest in certain contexts. So, you know, back in the 90s, people would occasionally talk about dial tone as being, uh, you know, a baseline standard for, uh, you know, gold standard for reliability. And, you know, this emoji depicts a landline telephone. Uh, so for anybody, you know, that hasn't seen one of these things before, uh, you used to have it in your house and there'd be a, a physical wire, like, that was made of copper that connected it to uh, an analog network that was, you know, the last mile of it was analog. The telephone company operated. And if you pick this thing up and, you know, you'd hear a particular two tones, and I'm not sure, it was like one was 440 hertz and the other one was something else. Um, you'd hear these two tones that told you the phone company was listening. And if you picked up the, the handset and that wasn't happening, it meant your phone was broken and it meant nothing else, right? It meant that there was no zombie apocalypse that had destroyed the telephone, you know. The, the probability of that was not possible to measure. And if I try to think of like complicated software artifacts that have reached that level of, you know, it must have been a zombie apocalypse before I start thinking these things, it's Google.com by a country mile, right? If I can't load Google.com on whatever piece of glass I'm looking at right now, I know the piece of glass isn't connected to the internet. I don't think, oh gosh, my, you know, my friends in Mountain View must be having a tough day at the office. It looks like uh, Google must have crashed, right? Uh, and there are a few other services that have reached that level of reliability. But this is really what people are hoping for these days. And absolutely any outage, even if it's planned, uh, you know, you're going to end up groveling and pleading and begging. Uh, so there's no, you know, the days of sort of the IT department sending an email saying, hey, we're going to be taking this thing down between, you know, midnight and 3 a.m. on Tuesday. Plan your lives around that accordingly and your work schedule around that accordingly. They're over. Uh, and you actually need to design software around this too, right, to be continuously operable. Uh, which gets me to my next point. People also expect to be able to do their work with lots, with a diversity of devices and a diversity of places and a diversity of times. Um, you don't know when inspiration's gonna strike. You don't know when it's gonna be important to be able to chase down some theory. You don't know when some insight's gonna happen. And it's really, really frustrating to not be able to act on that because, you know, something's locked to this, to some machine's MAC address that you left at work. Um, and this is one of the things that has a lot of software consequences because lots of devices today means lots of different software platforms, right? If I were giving this talk maybe seven years ago, I could say lots of devices means the web. The web happened, the web's out there, that's how you make clients now, just go web, web, web. Um, realistically, that's not an option, right? The sort of write once, run anywhere for, uh, for mobile 
hasn't happened yet, and there are reasons to think it might just not, like that things might just change again before that ever happens. Um, so this means that your software is more expensive to build. Um, you know, you really do just have to build n different clients for n different platforms right now. And um, one of the other things that is harder for me to talk about and sound authoritative, because I'm, my background's technical, I'm a systems person, um, is that people expect pleasure using software. They expect, if it's a tool, they expect it to feel fit to the purpose. They expect it to f have a nice balance to it and a good heft to it to fit their hands well. Um, and it is beyond my ken to explain what the constraints are that guide that. That's not my discipline. Uh, but I'm very aware that it's a constraint that, uh, that operates and that it determines the success and failure of companies. And I do think if I were to ask for, you know, if there was one thing about the, the Slack that I joined six months ago that I know was determinative of its success, it's this element of it. It's that it's a pleasing thing to use. It's a fun place to be a human being using software. Um, and finally, you know, this, the tone of this kind of gets hectoring after a while, like I'm, you know, coming over from consumer land and, you know, lecturing enterprise and how it needs to be. Uh, let's, let me give enterprise credit where it's due for something that it actually has all over what's called the consumer internet these days. Uh, and that is a really clear relationship with the users of their software, right? People understand where the relationships are here and how the incentives are aligned when uh, you're a customer of me and I make software, right? I want you to be successful so you can keep buying software. You want me to be successful so I can keep making the software you're buying better and cheaper. Uh, and it's just a straightforward win-win. At places like, you know, Google and Facebook, the world has figured it out that advertising is how this works, that it's a slightly more complicated transaction. There's this third party in the room, which is an advertiser. And for the most part, people have made peace with this, and this is sort of a problem that the consumer internet has solved. But it took them a few years. And for a while there, uh, it was actually very hard when I first started at Facebook, going from VMware, where you know, usually my interactions with customers were more likely to be positive than not, um, to you know, spend a lot of time at work at Facebook and be surrounded by engineers and product people and designers and so forth who are really, really sweating blood trying to make something awesome, uh, and then talk to a civilian and have the civilian just be like, yeah, I'm kind of creeped out. I don't really get kind of how, I don't quite get it. I'm not sure quite what you're doing with it. Don't get why it's free. Kind of like it, but feel weird about it. Um, that is not a trusting relationship, and that means that there are certain kinds of transactions and certain kinds of use cases that are going to be closed off from, from relationships where that kind of trust is absent. So this is actually something that I think enterprise, uh, you know, going back to that hyperplane that I think is bogus, this is something that enterprise has, you know, all over consumer right now. So trying to sum up here, uh, I think this is a, not a pendulum that's going to swing back. It's a permanent condition for the foreseeable future that humans are the users of software. Um, the fact that that bar has been raised is not going to suddenly go back because of some ecological or technological shift. People's expectations uh, have raised, and they also know that it's possible to build artifacts like this. They've had the experience. They've touched it with their hands. Um, and so uh, hopefully uh, the, we, I'll hand off to the design panel next so you can hear a little bit about how you actually, uh, you know, how people who have some amount of design sense and not just know how to code uh, actually solve some of these problems. All right, thank you very much.